Kenyan opposition leader Raila Odinga pushes for electoral reforms during his trip to the U.S. Conservationists urge Uganda to get tough on wildlife trafficking. And in our Music maker segment, Kenyan artist Webby. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. First tonight, Kenya's main opposition leader, Raila Odinga, is on a tour of the United States. He's taking his push for electoral reforms in Kenya straight to the U.S. Congress. His visit comes days after the, he called for an interim government to be formed to guide Kenya to fresh elections. Speaking at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, Odinga explained why his NASA alliance boycotted the October 26 repeat presidential poll and what he believes is the way forward for the country. And the biggest problem in Kenya right now is exclusion. Exclusion is a bigger issue. And when you see people begin to talk about cessation or wanting out of Project Kenya, it basically tells you that something is seriously wrong with, with Kenya that must be addressed and before the, the country tears apart. Well, Mr. Dinga warned of the consequences of a divided Kenya, saying he worries the country might disintegrate. Yeah, did not succeed in addressing uh, the U.S. Congress while here in Washington, as he is not a head of state, but is expected to meet with his supporters in this area and in New York before returning to Kenya uh, this weekend. Well, 18 people, including a provincial lawmaker, went on trial in Eastern Congo on Thursday for the rapes of dozens of children, as according to activists. At least 46 children, some as young as 18 months old, were raped near the village of Kavumu between 2013 and 2016, sparking an international outcry and criticism of Democratic Republic of Congo's government for its slow response. Rights groups hope the trial, which is expected to last several weeks, will strike a blow against impunity in Congo, where they say government forces and militia groups in the lawless eastern borderland have long used rape as a weapon of war. The trial opened in a, mil a military court in Kavumu, with the defendants facing charges of rape, murder, and organization of an armed group. Experts say Congo has made some progress in combating sexual violence, and several high-profile uh, militia and army commanders have been successfully prosecuted in recent years. But the problem remains. Now to West Africa, police in Nigeria's southern Delta state said they killed one suspect and arrested two others accused of involvement in the kidnapping last month of four Britons. Three of the British hostages who were taken by gunmen on October the 13th were released earlier this week after negotiations. But a fourth, Ian Square, was killed. Now the Delta state police spokesman said officers arrested two suspects and killed a third after he opened fire wounding two officers. Kidnapping for ransom is common in parts of Nigeria, including the Delta region that produces the bulk of the country's crude oil, but is mired in poverty and plagued by criminal and militant activity. Now, not too far from there, Sierra Leone is reeling from devastating mudslides, which killed hundreds and rendered more than 3,000 people homeless. Now, this came as the country is recovering from the 2014-2016 Ebola outbreak. Now, in the midst of all this, the West African nation is gearing up for a general election in March 18th, uh, March 2018, rather. Now, for some insights into the state of affairs in Sierra Leone, I'm joined in studio by Samuel Siddiq Sam Sumana, a veteran politician and a former Sierra Leonean vice president. Mr. Sumana, Sam Sumana, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much, Mr. President. So, uh, we, you know, you used to be vice president. You didn't just retire. Mm -hmm. 
They let you go, right? Not really. Yeah. <laughs> I was unconstitutionally removed. Yes. Yes. And uh, what were your crimes? Uh, there were baseless uh, allegations from the, my party. Um, looking at the uh, Constitution of Sierra Leone and the National Elections Act, it requires that uh, there are a few areas that you have to uh, adhere to in terms of the criteria set yeah. as a national age of 40 years plus, you belong to a political party, etc. These are some of the tenants within the uh, yeah. uh, Article 41 of the 1991 Constitution are the same embedded in the uh, Article 40 yeah. of the National Elections Commission. And these were fulfilled in my first time, in our first time of office, when I was um, up, uh, appointed by the president to be his running mate in 2007. Yeah. We did that, and um, later on, uh, we went back in 2012. The same set of criteria was uh, adhered to. I was appointed again, reappointed, and uh, we went through the uh, elections. Uh, while within uh, the electioneering period, unfortunately, because of uh, issues I'm sure we'll delve into, but just to stay focused on the question, uh, they came up with frivolous charges that one, uh, I was fomenting violence in my uh, mm -hmm. uh, backyard, in my district corner, uh, for which I say to me it's senseless. You cannot be, if you live in glass house, you don't throw stones. Exactly. I'm supposed to take development mm -hmm. to my district, my home district, not violence. And unlike violence, yeah. which I am not known for. Yeah. Um, secondly, they also allege that uh, my education, and education, um, they, um, it would interest you to know that they came, they went to my, uh, I'm sorry, they went to my university that I attended in Minnesota to find out that it is true that uh, indeed I did attend the university. Which and uh, yeah, okay. and, uh, they, they went yeah. there and they found out I, yes, went yeah. to university. Yeah. And they further also mentioned that uh, uh, when they found out that I yeah. went to the university, yeah. and then they said I uh, said I have a master's degree. But uh, they went through, uh, if you go through the application forms I had filled, in uh, so, uh, uh, submitted in 2007 yeah. and 2012. So there's no, no information on that. Now an election is coming up. Yes. 2018. Are you running? Y yes. For president. Yes. Now what is it you hope to bring to Sierra Leone at the moment? Everybody's making all sorts of promises, like all presidential candidates do. What is it that uh, Mr. Ernst Baikoroba, the current president, who is not going to run again, hasn't done that you think you can step in and do better? Um, I've worked. I served with Mr. Koroma as president and me as vice president for eight years. Um, one of, some of the issues I've found out working with him, uh, this is a country that has gone through a civil war. And there is need for us to come together. Uh, unifying the country will give us the strength to build a better nation. We are endowed with natural resources. But one of the issues that, I, that was very uh, clear was the issue of governance, good governance. Mm. And when you talk about good governance, that also includes uh, corruption, uh, um, issues of uh, nepotism, favoritism. And uh, I also looked at the issue of how we can improve on the social economic activities of our One country. of the major accusations against all politicians who are trying to get into office is that they say all these beautiful things yes. until they get in and then suddenly they turn away from the fight against corruption, nepotism, and all the other terrible things that happen to most of the African countries. Yes. So what is it that you can say to guarantee, to make somebody believe that you could be any different? Is it, is it about you or about actually building institutions that will control including you? This is not about me. Mm -hmm. It is about a nation, a country that has so much, but has gone through so, uh, so many difficulties. You cannot look at Sierra Leone as a post-conflict country that has suffered senseless civil war for 11 odd years with losing over 45,000 citizens. And then we were in it at a period again when we were going through the Ebola crisis and losing over 3,400 Sierra Leoneans. And in the midst of that, we're in the regulations that the Public Order Act and the president goes to violate the constitution of Sierra Leone because I said I will not subscribe to a third term ambition of the president. The constitution makes it very clear that we should have two terms. We were blessed as president, vice president, to be leaders for a country for 10 years. They gave us a mandate. 
why don't we adhere to the Constitution of Sierra Leone? This is a sacred document. If the Christians believe in the, in the Bible, and the Muslims believe in the Quran, or the Jews believe in the Torah, we and leadership should also respect and uphold the, the Constitution of Sierra Leone. And indeed... In so, if you mention that uh, we, what I can do different, is because I have I, I identified working with Koroma and the APC. I am second generation the APC party, mm -hmm. but I realized that even when the SLPP was in government, the Sierra Leone People's Party, I was offered ministerial positions twice. I turned it down because I did yeah. not believe in them. Yeah. And now, Koroma, I work with Koroma I, I, with the idea okay, that sir. I'm coming to work with somebody that we can develop our country. You know, we'll be watching you. I will hope you win. You bet. You and bet. Uh, we'll come after you <laughs> and you ask bet. you if you did your you job. Bet. You bet. We appreciate so much you joining us today and sharing uh, some of your thoughts with Thank us. Thank you so much. I appreciate insights. that. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Well, that's uh, Samuel Siddiq Sam uh, Sumana, who is a veteran politician, a former vice president of Sierra Leone. Now, the White House Friday attempted to put to rest uh, speculation that U.S. President Donald Trump might hold talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin on the sidelines of the Asian Pacific Economic Summit in Vietnam. Now, the White, uh, White House press secretary characterized any conversation the two leaders might have as being a brief chat. Sarah Sanders added that no formal talks are scheduled. A Kremlin aide had told Russian news agencies that Putin and Trump would meet Friday on the sidelines of the summit in Da Nang. Trump told reporters as he headed for the trip to Asia, he expects to meet with Putin to ask for his help in reigning in North Korea, uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons development. Now, the leaders of the United States and China offered starkly contrasting views of the direction for the trade in Asia in separate speeches to regional business leaders on Friday. VOA White House uh, Bureau Chief Steve Herman reports from Da Nang in Vietnam. Taking the stage at a meeting for top corporate executives of the Asia-Pacific region, U.S. President Donald Trump told the audience he is willing to make one-on-one -on -one trade deals with any country in the region. But he firmly rejected multinational deals, such as the 12-nation Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was quickly abandoned in the first days of his administration. I will make bilateral trade agreements with any Indo-Pacific nation that wants to be our partner and that will abide by the principles of fair and reciprocal trade. What we will no longer do is enter into large agreements that tie our hands, surrender our sovereignty, and make meaningful enforcement practically impossible. Trump lamented that in the past, when his country lowered market barriers, other countries did not open their markets to the United States. From now on, however, Trump warned, the United States will expect that our partners will faithfully follow the rules. We expect that markets will be open to an equal degree on both sides, and that private industry, not government planners, will direct investment. Chinese President Xi Jinping whose country's rise has been driven greatly by large-scale government planning, immediately followed Trump on the stage in Da Nang. She embraced the multilateral concept, in particular calling for support for a free trade area of the Asia-Pacific, which would harmonize regional and bilateral economic pacts. China was left out of the TPP, which was led by the United States and Japan, and was meant in great part as a bulwark against China's strategic ambitions. She also termed globalization an irreversible trend, but said the world must work to make it more balanced and inclusive. At present, the progress toward economic globalization is experiencing headwind. One of the reasons is that it is not inclusive enough. There needs to be more effort to make sure that different countries and people from different walks of life can all enjoy the benefits of development and that the beautiful view in the distance becomes reality. The competing views on display here by the leaders of the two largest economies and militaries leaves open the question of whether competing approaches will eventually lead to a clash between the United States and China, or they will find a way to peacefully coexist in the long term. Steve Herman, VOA News, Da Nang, Vietnam.
What I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now coming up, promoting wildlife conservation in Uganda. Stay with us. And notes. This is Living Better. In response to the spiking numbers of deaths associated with the U.S. opioids crisis, in 2015, funeral home director Timothy Gardner added an English Springer Spaniel to services he offers near Buffalo, New York. After some time in training school, that dog, Charlotte, is now a full time grief counselor. Instead of this institution called a funeral home, and people don't want to be here, so the dog makes it a little more interesting, a little more inviting, a little more welcoming. Therapy dogs are becoming more common in the United States, and Timothy Gardner says they are unnatural for people in mourning. I think that comfort dogs should have started at a funeral home. Health experts say therapy dogs can help people to lower their stress and even blood pressure levels. Dogs typically undergo 12 weeks of training for their work with centers or individuals. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Bay. Uganda's government has been on a mission to ramp up tourism. One of its strategies has been to promote wildlife conservation with a new slogan, poaching stills from us all. But wildlife trafficking may be the bigger problem. An investigation earlier this year by the Washington-based NAF project identified Uganda as a key transit point for illegal wildlife products living East Africa and Central Africa. Halima Athumanu reports from Kampala. The message is simple, protect our wildlife, and several local Ugandan celebrities are delivering it. Our elephants, lions, and gorillas are facing so many threats. We need our wildlife. It brings in the tourists who bring in the money. So let's all sing the same song, stand up for our wildlife. Because poaching steals from us all. Home to some 5,000 elephants, ivory seizures in Uganda have been rising. Authorities have intercepted a total of 12 tons of ivory in the past six years. But poaching in Uganda has been on the decline. The last spike was in 2011 with 25 elephants killed that year, according to the Uganda Wildlife Authority. Since then we've been losing a maximum of about 15, 10, so that wouldn't be the source of the tons and tons of ivory that we are seeing. So this ivory is definitely coming from all corners of Africa. We have seized ivory that has been traced as far as Angola, of course, uh, some as far as Tanzania, DRC, South Sudan. Conservationists say raising local awareness is good, but that Uganda must also take a stronger stance on wildlife trafficking. In Tanzania, people trafficking wildlife products can face up to 10 years in prison. In Kenya, up to life imprisonment. Meanwhile, in Uganda, the maximum penalty is just a fine of 300 US dollars. Our wildlife flow gives the, the least penalty to anyone found guilty of trafficking. Uh, but also we have, the traffickers have, ident have identified loopholes in our legal system, in our, um, in our policing system, so they know they can beat the system and find their way out. Meaning they connive 
with uh, with the road uh, enforcers and find their way out. Now that's the that's where you need to go and address. Amendments to the Wildlife Act currently before Uganda's parliament would toughen the penalties for wildlife crime, including a maximum sentence of life in prison. Halima Asmani for VA News, Kampala. Now this week, Ivory Coast signed a nearly $525 million compact grant to the U.S. government's Millennium Challenge Corporation. Money will be spent over a five-year period to spur economic growth in the West African country and promote regional stability and security. VOA correspondent Mariama Diallo reports. The grant is designed to support growth and private investment by building up workers' skills and reducing transportation costs. Ivorian President Alassane Ouattara told VOA he welcomed the move. The money in education will be used to build uh, classrooms to improve the skills of uh, the young people because youth employment is an objective of the government. And uh, on the transport side, it will be investment in the transport of Abidjan because Abidjan is a city of six million people. It's uh, congested and uh, so we, find to, we need to find ways to make sure that uh, we improve uh, the fluidity of, uh, of uh, movement in Abidjan. In a signing ceremony at the U.S. State Department, Jonathan Nash, the Millennium Challenge Corporation's acting CEO, said a lack of training for workers has constrained the Ivorian economy. We will focus on improving basic literacy and numeracy skills in secondary education, complemented by an innovative technical and vocational training model that is closely linked with the actual needs of the private sector. MCC was established by former President George W. Bush and over the years has benefited from bipartisan support. The agency works with developing countries that have committed to good governance and economic freedom, among other benchmarks. Only seven years ago, Ivory Coast endured a deep political crisis when then-President Laurent Gbagbo was forcibly removed from office after refusing to accept the result of presidential elections won by Alassane Ouattara. But since 2012, the country has had one of Africa's fastest-growing economies with annual GDP growth of about 9%. Watara said discipline is key to maintaining this kind of growth. Good macroeconomic policies, solid macroeconomic framework that will attract foreign investment. And if you have good governance that the money is used in the priority sectors, obviously this leads to growth. At Washington's Center for Strategic and International Studies, President Watara said that as the world's top cocoa and raw cashew nut exporter, his country needs to be more aggressive on the processing side. We produce 40 percent of the world cocoa, and yet we only process about 30 percent. We're the first world producer of cashew nuts. There again, we uh, process uh, less than 10 percent. The president said another challenge is the fight against terrorism. He recalled the deadly attack last year in the town of Grand Bassam and pleaded for more coordination and support for his country and the newly established G5 Sahel counterterrorism group. Maria Madialo, VOA News, Washington. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, Kenyan performer Webby. We'll be right back. So this crisis can be seen in the hitherto unheard of phenomenon of mainstreaming Kenya's feeling so deeply excluded.
Welcome back to Africa 54 and here's what's trending. Christmas is coming and children around the world are preparing their wish list for Santa. Now at the Dream Toys event in London, Roaring Tyler the Tiger is a hit. The interactive toy responds to sound and motion commands. In many countries, the top selling toy at the moment is the LOL Surprise. Uh, the tennis ball size toys contain tiny dolls which can be dressed and accessorized. They're part of the collectible trend which is seeing um, enormous growth in 2017. Well, next up, commuters of the future could get uh, some relief from congested roads if Uber's plans for flying taxis work out. At the Web Summit Tech event in Lisbon, Portugal, the ride-hailing service unveiled an artist's impression of the sleek, futuristic machine it hopes to start using for demonstration flights in 2020. Now, hoping commuters are still interested in moving on the ground is Swedish startup Unita. The crowd-funded company is aiming to launch an electric, uh, electric city car that is optimized for the high performance and agility in busy urban environments. Now staying at the Lisbon Web Summit, a collection of startups are showing how tech can help care for our environment. Now the company that produces this biofiltration unit believes the systems can be used on a large scale in the future. Meanwhile, a company featured a smartphone app that is basically a social network for forest fires. It measures and analyzes fire intensity, area dryness, and wind speed direction to give predictions and information to emergency services and others so they can act. And that is what is trending today. Well, we close our show today with the music of Kenyan artist Webby. Now, the song is New Day DJ Format. From all of us here in Washington, have a good night.